Hold up, let's get real. Welcome to Real Talk with Ronnie. Today we have Jenny Moness. Um, before we begin, do not forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel and the podcast and follow me on social media at Ronnie Calra. Welcome, Jenny. Hi. Hi. Jenny is an early childhood educator. She has her master's in early childhood education and also psychology. Um, she's co-founder of Union Square Play, which is this amazing location in Union Square for little kids to go, and we can talk about that in a bit. Yes. And she's also founder of Mo Mommies, which is a resource, that's actually how I know you, um, on social media and sort of my go-to in terms of products for children, activities for kids, behavioral advice, and we'll get into all that in a bit, but Mo Mommies was, was how I was introduced to you. Yes. So I want to know how you began. Tell me about how you began Mo Mommies and tell me about Union Square Play. Sure. Um, yeah, one thing when you were describing what Mo Mommies is, is, I feel like there's also this piece that wasn't planned, but it's also become this real personal, honest account of motherhood, mm -hmm. and that wasn't my plan. I thought maybe I wouldn't even show my kids on it, and that it would really just be a resource using all of my experience in my career, which had been about 10 years at that point, and showing how I was going to be caring for and bringing up my young baby and sort of educating her from the start. I yeah. felt like a lot of my friends and parents out there don't know if they're stimulating enough, what they should buy, how to teach, all these things that you can Google, but then it's like, which avenue should Too I Too many go? answers. Right. Every time I Google something, I end up more confused. Exactly. So I wanted to just show what I was doing, and I was confident that the way that I was doing it was the right way. I mean, I know that's not fact, but that's how I feel and felt yeah. in terms of, you know, allowing our children to kind of lead the way in their development. So really, it was basically um, a way of telling parents, like, you really don't need to do much and that the right way is trusting in your baby's innate ability to kind of lead that way. Right. And that we can just kind of create this environment to allow them to flourish. And so that's what it started as, sharing that. And then I had my first child about a month after I launched it and was like, oh my God, like, who cares about all this? Let's just survive and connect with each other because Literally. that's how overwhelmed I felt. Yeah. And yeah, and then I started in-person groups and play groups for my own benefit as well. Mm -hmm. And then I met someone who I then co-founded a play space with just a few blocks down, Union Square Play. And did you do that because you felt something was lacking, like you couldn't find somewhere to go? So both. I think that I had worked at daycares as a teacher and director, and I wasn't in love with that anymore because it became very administrative. So I wanted to stay connected yeah. um, with parents and their babies. So I did it for my own um, fulfillment in mm -hmm. life. I, I found it so rewarding and it obviously was my life's passion, but at the same time was going through this huge change of becoming a mom finally myself after working in this industry for so long and then kind of struggling with IVF and then I became a mom. So I did it for myself, but also felt definitely that it was needed, that we have these babies, especially in New York City, and I sort of feel like that early stage is kind of like the forgotten age, you know? Mm -hmm. You have preschools and daycares, but there's this like year or two that you're kind of home by yourself or you're on maternity leave, mm -hmm. and then after that you go back to work and it's like, what do I do with this little human? And right. they are people already. Right. And how do I meet other people going through it at the same time? Right. So I think I did it for my career's choice, but also definitely because I think that there's play spaces out there, but not community. I also find that like when my baby was born, a part of you is like, what you're doing right now, does it matter? Because is it, right. is it being soaked in? Like, I didn't know. Um, <laughs> is it necessary to engage with them in certain ways? Or like, are they just tiny little potatoes? that like you just have to make sure survive and like grow and like you're feeding them. But you know, the more you read and the more I followed you, like it is necessary. And like what happens really early on, you know, can kind of set the stage, right? you know? And like you, you always hear about the worst case scenario. So children that are unfortunately born into really bad situations and how that affects their life. Right. But you don't learn about like if you're born into a, 
a blessed or fortunate situation and you're able to have these parents who are able to give you these resources or understand what it takes, you know, in the first three months, like what you should be doing and shouldn't be doing, that like that could also have a long term effect right. on your life and like your learning capabilities and your patience and like your anxiety and yeah. like, all of that. And um, it's kind of twofold. So not only is there ways of being really thoughtful with how you're parenting for your child's benefit, but I think that it also is a really incredible way to build confident parents and less anxious parents that they can kind of have this toolbox that isn't something to adhere to, but for them to kind of find on their own with my guidance. Mm -hmm to know what to do and to kind of be their own Google. That's mm-hmm. kind of what I always say that, um, you know, that I want, I don't want people to be like, I have to ask Jenny this question, but to kind of become their own expert. I still feel like I should ask <laughs> I, want, I want to empower, <laughs> and, and they still can, yeah. but you know what I mean? That like yeah. you, you'd be surprised. It's like kind of subconscious that you'll ask me questions, but then you'll be in situations and you might still say, what would Jenny do? But Mm -hmm. you'll kind of like know what is best for you and your child Mm -hmm. using these principles that kind of lead you. Yeah. And what I found was like the most life changing was like small, tiny changes in the way that we react or communicate with our small human beings, like makes all the difference in the way that they feel about what we're about to do. So like, I'll never forget, you posted something about how you told your husband that he should stop asking your daughter, like, can I change your diaper? (laughs) And because like, we do that. Like, I'm like, Leah, can I change your diaper now? And obviously the answer is no. Like, why would she want that to happen? She wants to play or do whatever she's doing. Can I put you in your crib now? Like, no. (laughs) No, obviously no. So just the the little mental switch of like, stop asking her, but telling her like, this is what we're going to do. And then we're going to do that because after we're going to do something really fun. Um, and I still catch myself like stopping oh, myself me from too. asking her every damn question. Are you ready for lunch? No. <laughs> like, yeah. Leah, it's time for lunch and then we're going to do X, Y, and Z. Right. You and know? not only is it harder for you because they could say no and then it's like, oh, wait, I shouldn't have asked you. But it's also allowing them to understand like they have a leader and yeah. that gives them security in right. a way. Like they don't want all that power. There's a very big misunderstanding that they want this power and they they exude that Mm -hmm. because they're like little um, problem solvers and sort of manipulators in a way, in a Mm -hmm. good way of Mm -hmm. figuring out how the world works, but they don't want all that power. They test us and push us, but they want us to be the leader. They Mm -hmm. want us to tell them what's happening and not put all that power in, in their hands. That's also why I tell parents, like, don't ever ask, what do you want for dinner? I think that's overwhelming. I very rarely know what I want for dinner, but mm-hmm. giving choices, I think, do especially you at a young age, at yeah. a young age, like, do you want pizza or do you want um, something else? That's sorry, <laughs> that's not pizza. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to be right. Like, no, they're always gonna want the yeah. pizza, but like, do you want chicken or fish? Like, giving options. If you say, what do you want? They might say ice cream, and then yes. again, you're in a situation yeah. where it's like, why did I ask? So, yeah, because then you have to say no. Right. And like, you don't want no to be like your, yeah. your majority of your conversations. So, right, giving them choices, but also being their leader. Right, okay. Yeah. Um, one of the main reasons I have to say that I started engaging with you on social media, because I was following you, and I was pregnant at the time, and like, my head was spinning. So like, obviously <laughs> I didn't know what the hell to do. So I started following you. I actually bought the Duna because of you. (laughs) Duna should pay you. Duna was a great investment. Um, But then when I had her, I started asking you questions and you were very responsive to me. Um, And it was very helpful because once they're there, like you have this plan, right, in your head when you're pregnant. You have like this vision of what you're going to do. And then they arrive and it's like a joke. Right. Like that plan is a joke. Yeah. Yeah. So, um... One of the things that you had talked about on social media that I thought was really important, and you had also posted about it, and I read your article about schemas, and I had never heard of such a thing. Um, and it really resonated with me because I have this app, Wonder Weeks, that I had about her, her entire first year. And every week it kind of tells you the mental leap that they're going through, the developments that they're going through, and what to expect. And it's funny because they have a calendar, and it shows like a sunny week versus like a lightning bolt, which means like, it's gonna be testy. 
And it's scary because like you look at your personal calendar and you're like, well, we have this and this and this party and this party and this party. And apparently she's going to be a nightmare. Oh, wow. You know, so it's like a little like it gave me anxiety, to be honest. And so when you posted about schemas, it was very helpful because it was more about their behavior and less blanket statement like this week is going to suck. So schemas are urges or natural inclinations that children have as they're figuring out the world and it manifests in repetitive behaviors that are often annoying. Mm -hmm. So throwing, banging, climbing into a shelf or trying to climb into a bowl that they clearly can't fit into. All these are hoarding a bunch of things. Slamming a door? Yeah, opening and closing doors. Mm. And (laughs) it's ways that they're thinking about and discovering the world Mm -hmm. and it shows through their play. So these are all ways that they're figuring out the world and playing. Mm -hmm. Um, But not only that, there's different types of schemas. There's about, I think we talked about it, like maybe six of them. Mm -hmm. And almost every behavior that parents see their children doing can be explained according to a schema. Mm -hmm. And I more mean behaviors when you're like, why is my child doing this? I remember being a teacher for a pre-K class and some kids, one, one child in particular was like collecting things in his cubby. And at the time I'm like, oh my God, is he like stealing from the class? Like, you know, I didn't know about schemas. This was like early in my career. And then I started to realize he's collecting things. Like it's sort of like, I like these and I have a feeling of wanting to bring them everywhere I go. Yeah. So I'm going to collect them and bring them and hoard them and it's also why when children are learning to potty train it's hard for them to leave their items but there's also the schemas that you don't even realize are categoric categorical behaviors Mm -hmm. like standing up in a high chair when you're at a restaurant and feeling like my child just misbehaving but really they're trying to discover the world from different heights Mm -hmm. i mean if you think about it they're seeing the world from a completely different perspective and they're sitting in this tall high chair and mm. they get to see from an even different perspective and they want to stand up and see right. from, from even a higher They're not one. just trying to piss you off. Right. Or Which wanting like to hang upside think. down off of a bed. Right. They right. want to see the world upside down. Throwing things. It's called um, the trajectory schema. Mm. What happens when I throw this? What happens when I throw the ball versus the glass? When I throw the glass, it shatters. And that's really uncomfortable for us. My daughter threw a wine glass the other day. And not that I thought it was okay. Of course, at this age, like, I've gone through with her. You can't throw this, but you can throw that. As opposed to just saying, don't throw. Mm -hmm. I know that she has a natural desire to throw. Right, because we want her to throw the ball. Right. And we tell her to throw the ball. And, like, you might see children throwing food off their high chair. Mm -hmm. A lot of times parents experience that and they think their kids are misbehaving. They're exploring. Mm -hmm. What happens when I throw this? It either splatters or it plops or it bounces. Mommy gets mad. Like, Mm -hmm. (laughs) there's ways of, of... they're they're um, exhibiting these behaviors and seeing what happens. With My them. daughter threw her piggy bank that she was gifted on her first birthday from a dear friend of mine from Tiffany last oh night, gosh. and it shattered everywhere. And she didn't realize that it shattered, and she wanted it. And then we couldn't let her go to it because there was glass right. everywhere, and it was a little bit of a disaster. Um, And she cried for a very long time. And then I had to literally show her the pieces and say it broke. Right. And she wanted it. And I'm like, no, there's really sharp glass here. But that's like a valuable lesson for her to to kind of realize like what happens to different things when they're thrown. Yeah. Um, And saying to her, that's why we don't throw this. Mm -hmm. Or that's why I can't let you throw things like this. And I can let you throw a ball or something soft. Um, There was no explaining. Not only that, like, right. In the the 20 minutes of the of the. No, Break then down. it's just like you wanted to throw that and it broke and yeah. you don't have it right now. That's yeah. really hard. <laughs> yeah. Really, really hard. Yeah. And you also want to go play with the broken glass, which I will never let you do. So we're just gonna we're just gonna break down now. And isn't that also like understanding their perspective? Like I'm just thinking of like when a mom pumps milk and it spills. Like we very badly want that back. Yes. <laughs> and we can't get that yes. back. Yes. And so imagine from a child's perspective, like how hard that is. So, so frustrating. Yeah. That's actually such a good analogy. Because I would literally <laughs> well, I cry. always think of an analogy is when I'm like, when my child's experiencing yeah. something like that. It just helps you be more thoughtful. Yeah, that's very smart.
always put yourself in their situation, even though right. sometimes it's hard. And know that it's probably even harder than you being in their situation because they're young and really not as emotionally mature as us, obviously. Right. Or able to understand like the cause and effect of right. things as well as we can. But I think with schemas, it's really helpful to know because it's not like trying to extinguish a behavior. It's understanding that my child's doing this because he's actually like becoming a little scientist and figuring out the world. So let me figure out ways that he could still do that that are okay. Yeah. Like you can't stand in the high chair, but maybe we can play at the park after and you can go way up high on the swing or climb up on the slide you know you can just try and be creative or or at least just even acknowledge i know you want to stand up and see from up there but you're gonna fall and hurt it's gourself. gonna hurt yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so recently you just had your second daughter yeah tell us about mom life with two and i want you to get real with me <laughs> how is it different from mom life of one because i know what that's so, like so but- I think with mom life of one, you ex- go through this um, transition of a new you. Yeah, totally. You know, I read something the other day that no one tells you in the whole nine months that you're going to meet someone at the end and it's not going to be your baby. It's yeah. going to be you. Yeah, you look in the mirror and you're a different person. Right. And not in a bad way. No. Like, you still have who you are, but it, you've grown even more. And totally. so for me, having one was about that. And then having two, again, you go through a transition, but it's less about, you know, you're already a mom at that point. So for me, it was more about this transition of logistics, of pushing myself to like new exhaustion levels, new, you know, physical levels. You know, my back hurts a lot more now. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So like, I think it's just pushing all the things even further, but then knowing that I'm you know, of course I've gotten such a gift with another baby, but I'm also giving my first child such a gift. And so that also helps a lot with the guilt towards my first. Um, But I'd say that the transition was about, you know, changing personally with my first. And now it's just like the craziness everyone says it is of just like figuring out this new family life. New normal. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's nuts. I can't even yeah, imagine. We all are going through the change this time. So my child, right. my husband, and me, whereas before it was just me and my husband. So right. that's like why I think going from one to any is harder than zero to one. Yeah. Personally. That's what they say. Although zero to one is also like the fear of the unknown, I feel. Right. Like, you so know? it's different hard. But it's different it's hard. But it's less... You're just focusing on your transition then. Yes. And then when you exp- you're you thinking about your child going through this huge transition, it's like a lot. And taking care of the new child. Right, right. <laughs> and like paying attention equally to both. Right. Was Tess jealous at all of your time spent with Nell because you breastfed? Yeah. Or you so, were still breastfeeding? Yeah. I'm like, you know, in the process of weaning. Um, not letting go yet. But mm-hmm. <laughs> I think that... She was jealous, and it was hard, and is hard, but it was never about getting rid of the baby, which I thought it would be. Yeah. So she's so happy she's here and loves her, but is, again, the same way, like, we all, you never want to give back the baby. Yeah. You just want to figure out how to to lead this new life, and I think that's what she's doing. Like, she still will like cry in the other room with whoever's helping her when I'm preoccupied with the baby. Mm-hmm. I know she's not saying mommy necessarily, but I know she's becoming like whinier and needier yeah. because of that. Yeah. Whereas before it was just crying for me. Now she's like trying to figure out how to cope without, because she can't have me. I'm, I'm tied up, yeah. you know? Yeah. So she's growing a lot faster and maturing a lot more than like probably she ever would have. Yeah, I think that's also like the blessing in disguise. Like when you have a sibling, you're forced to grow up because you have to do things for yourself a little bit more and like your parents are gonna rely on you a little bit more and it's almost a good thing because you're gonna grow up anyway. But it is another like hard part of like, oh, this isn't my baby anymore and like that happening overnight, but yeah. yeah. So my sister and I are seven years apart. I know you have sisters too. Yeah. Um, my parents had a difficult time between me and her, like getting pregnant. They lost a few babies, and so finally, like it was, I I was seven. So to me, it was like I'm getting like a small doll to play with. You like you know, I, I remember yeah. everything. Yeah. And then she came, and she obviously occupied all of my mother's time, and she was like pulling my hair and spitting up all over me. And I, at one point, I was like, you know what, mom, like put her back. 
My uh-huh. mom's like, no, she's here to stay. <laughs> like you wanted this and now she's here and now she's yours. So deal with her. And I was right. like, mm, she cries too much. <laughs> My mom was like, like a, yeah, a, you a, used to cry too. Right. Like imagine how hard it is for us to hear our babies cry and then imagine your other baby hearing the baby cry. Yeah. Like, I think about that all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we wrap up, one question that I ask all my guests, and I yes. never prep them, is if you weren't doing what you're doing, what would you be doing? Yes. Um, so it's funny you ask because it might sound like completely unrelated to what I'm doing, but I say I would be working, or actually I haven't said this, but I think that I would be working in forensics in some way, mm-hmm. which seems so different and like darker than working with kids. Mm-hmm. Um, Jenny has a dark side. <laughs> but I think the psychology of it is what I find most intriguing, like law and order. SVU. Yeah. I was just going to say. Like I love figuring out babies and I think working in forensics in that way is figuring out every type of mind. And yeah. so to me that seems like it would be really like interesting would you work in like a jail (laughs) or would you work maybe yeah I more think like it's an an investigator maybe okay interesting it probably sounds better than it would be in theory it would probably be a little bit scary but definitely be scary in New York City (laughs) however I love that it's completely opposite of what you do because that's why I ask you know you always have this vision of like something completely different than what you're doing and I'm always curious to know because you, you, you yeah. find out so much about that person. I'm sure there's like eight other things that I've thought of yeah. that I might do, but that came to mind first. Good. I like it. <laughs> um, one last question I've been meaning to ask you. I feel like you never get angry. Does Jenny <laughs> ever raise her voice? Oh my God. It's Should I ask so, her husband? Yes. <laughs> I'm like the people close to me. So it's funny. You're like, so I know even, I have a distinct voice. Like, very to distinct. To the point where like I'd call like... I used to say I'd call Time Warner and they'd be like, hi, Miss Hirschfeld at the time because like everyone knows my voice. Yeah. Um, And I don't hear it the way other people do, but I guess it's like a little bit monotone so it can be deceiving that I'm like always calm, cool, and collected. I feel like you're always calm, cool, and collected. And with what I say to be like with children is calm, cool, and collected. So I think I definitely have that side of me, but definitely have the other side. Not where I have like a temper, but... Yeah, where I definitely do. You do? Yeah. I don't believe you. I feel Not like I've temper said... where I raise my voice. Like, I'm human. Yes. Like, even though I'm Are a... you? <laughs> I have a short fuse, so it's like very... I do too. Like, on I the road... I fly off the handle. Oh, my God. I oh, can't... you have road I, rage? I don't want to drive in flat iron because I feel like people, like, will see me and, like, this is my community. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll be outed? Right. I swear. Guys, if you find Denny <laughs> screaming somewhere, please record it and send it to me. <laughs> I will not show the press. It is going to happen. But, I mean, it, it would just prove to me that you are actually right. human because I, 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 I definitely like am. I don't know. Yeah, um, thank you so are. much for coming on thank Real Talk you. with Ronnie. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast and YouTube. Follow me on social media at Ronnie Calra. And follow Jenny <laughs> at Mo Mommies. Mo Mommies and Union Square Play if you're ever in the city and want to come play. Yeah, I love it. Thank you.